morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship here this morning at uh, with the congregation of Hopewell Presbyterian Church. Um, do we have any announcements? We haven't signed up for the order of pies yet. Okay, pies. They're getting ready to order the supplies for the seasonal pies. If you haven't ordered your pies yet, you better do it because they won't have enough supplies to make one for you later. <laughs> Anything, yeah. Uh, the stewardship letters are, are out in the narthex. Please take your, your it should, there should be one with your name on it, and if there isn't, there's some extra standing up in the back. Um, if you're trying to save postage, uh, if you do not pick it up, that would be great. Okay, so put, uh, stewardship letters, pick up. Um, on your way out. Yeah, and also if you fill yours out, you can give me some Mitch Cooper. Okay, I've already <laughs> surprised. <laughs> if you've already filled it out, you're welcome to turn it in at any time. Uh, anything else? And let's uh, take a moment, uh, quiet, and um, think about why we're here this morning and what we hope to hear and learn. Please join me in the responsive call to worship printed in your bulletin. For God alone, we wait in silence. Our hope is in God. God alone is our rock and salvation, our fortress. We shall not be shaken. On God rests our deliverance and our honor. Our mighty rock, our refuge, is in God. We trust God at all times. We pour out our hearts before our God, who is a refuge for us. Those of low estate are but a breath. Those of high estate are a delusion. If riches increase, do not set your heart on them. Power and love belong to you, O God. Our hope is in you. Our opening hymn is number 300. 61, how firm a foundation. We'll sing, the, there are lots of verses. We'll sing the first two. Please stand as you are. Please join me in the unison 
prayer confession. God of the wilderness and the city, God of all time, you have called your church to follow you and show the world the faith of the gospel. But we acknowledge that we have failed to answer your calls, for we have too often lived in the past and fear your future. In Jesus Christ, you have broken down the dividing walls that separate your church from the world. But still, we are tempted to hide behind borders of comfort and habit and nostalgic thinking. Forgive us for the fear that holds us back from the new world you have in mind for us and for all. Give us courage to leave the safe and familiar behind us and to follow where you would have us go. Fill us with your great love for your whole creation and all of your children. Hear now this assurance of pardon. Do not fear. You can place your trust in God, for God will lead you, comfort you, protect you. You are not alone to face all the difficulties of life. God is with you and will lift you up. Rejoice, for you are loved by God. Join me in the unison prayer for illumination. May your word come to us with much conviction, O oh God, so that hearing what you have to say to us, our lives may be enlightened, our hearts encouraged, and our paths made clear. Amen. The um, New Testament reading I will include later on in the message. The Hebrew scripture reading is one of the many um, images of the new world, the new creation that we look forward to, that we hope for, the, the kingdom of God. And um, I'm not going to talk about this vision directly, this image in the scripture, but I want you to hold it in your mind as a reminder of the promises that God makes. Hear now this word um, from the prophet Isaiah. The word that Isaiah, son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. In days to come, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be raised above the hills. All the nations shall stream to it. Many people shall come and say, let come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, 
to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways and we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth instruction and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations and shall arbitrate for many peoples. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. O house of Jacob, come, let us walk in the light of the Lord. This is the word of God, good people. So last week, we talked about systemic embedded privilege and the multiple kinds of isms and phobias in our culture that label others and exclude them, and how those can be invisible to us, how we have to open ourselves to see them and to see the oppression and pain that they cause. But we're also regularly faced with the far too visible version of those attitudes and emotions, overt fear and hatred that can lead not just to discrimination, but to death. Just in case you don't know, I've never mentioned my own background. In, in some of these areas, I've spent over 20 years um, working in interfaith groups and in anti-racism. And not just, you know, some of my friends, but in my top, you know, five to ten friends in my life, um, there are fewer people like me than might be supposed. My top ten friends, there are Jews, Muslims, people who are gay, people of color, immigrants. And over recent years, I've been heartbroken over so many of these manifestations of hatred. The uh, Charleston shooting in a black church where the pastor was a classmate of many of my colleagues from my seminary. The Pittsburgh synagogue shooting where the pastor of the neighboring Presbyterian church just down the block is a good friend who knew that Jewish congregation and who did shared interfaith services with them. The mosque tragedy in New Zealand where 51 people were killed in an attack linked to increasing white supremacy. Over all the deaths and the violence in the Middle East, where I personally have both family and friends, on every side of every line you can draw there. I've spent more than an entire year in my life in total time over the last 20 in the Middle East mostly in Jordan, but also Egypt and Turkey and Israel. I've been to the West Bank and spoken with Palestinian refugees in Jordan. I've known Holocaust concentration survivors. And I'm ripped apart, I'm just ripped apart all the time. The general presbyter in the presbytery I moved up from was uh, Wilson Gunn, who wrote columns regularly in the Presbytery newsletter. And he wrote this uh, one time, um, a number of years ago. I must say a word about fear. It is life's only true opponent. Only fear can defeat life. It has no decency. It respects no law or convention. It shows no mercy. It goes for our weakest spot, which it finds with unerring ease. Fear is our own embodiment of a lack of trust. We fear that God won't take care of us. 
So we value power and control. We value self-sufficiency, taking care of ourselves and our own, and how narrowly we define our own. We all do face real threats to our lives, our safety, our health, our finance, but the reality of those threats and fears does not actually tell us how to deal with them specifically as Christians, as Jesus people. One thing that happens when we're afraid is that we forget we're in God's hands. Or we mouth the words as we said nice words about trust in our call to worship, but we don't live as though we really believe those words. Our fear can be overpowering when our familiar world seems to be disintegrating around us and we don't know what the future will bring. The world that seems to be falling apart around us is the same world where we've invested in ourselves. The world where all of our concerns and interests are our finances, our jobs, our health, our children, our governments, and our communities. When the systems that provide our sense of security start to crumble, we may be afraid. We may be very, very afraid. And then we try to make ourselves safe to provide our own ultimate security. Those of you who are familiar with some of the more famous, well-known Bible stories will remember the story of um, the time when Moses went up to the mountain for a long time and people began to be anxious and afraid because their leader wasn't there. And so they went to Aaron and Aaron had them give all of their gold, their jewelry, whatever they had, and made a golden calf for them to worship save them. And they gave everything they had. And it was a real impulse, it was maybe even a generous impulse, but nonetheless, what they had done was build an idol. When we're afraid and try to make ourselves safe, we try to provide for our own ultimate security. And very often how we do that is we try to box God into a space where we can feel sure that we've got God all figured out and we can feel entirely sure that God is on our side in everything and in every way. But our religion, our faith, calls believers to transcend our baser instincts to rise above our fears. And our particular faith, among all the, among others that share those, that notion of transcendence, our particular faith calls us directly, specifically, explicitly to care for the most vulnerable among us, to welcome and help the stranger, and even to love our enemies. But our fear can blot out all of that religious teaching, no matter how often we hear it. We retreat into tribalism and we demonize others. Sisters and brothers, we've seen how fear comes into our election cycle. Candidates point to many kinds of others and urge voters to blame them for their fears. Someone else is doing this to you. Someone is taking from you. Someone is displacing you. And we end up making idols of our leaders. We make idols of our country, of our flag, and our privileges. And we even make idols of our religion. But all of our privileged definitions about who is safe and who is threatening who's worthy of love, and even who's worthy of life, those are all ultimately false idols. Methodist Bishop Will Willimon once said, there's nothing more dangerous than a powerful nation that is afraid. 
in the first letter of John, we're told, and we've all heard this, we're told that perfect love casts out fear. But here's the problem, our love is rarely perfect, so we're often afraid. But one thing does seem to be true, unfortunately, and that is that perfect fear casts out love. Nazi Field Marshal Goring said in an interview, naturally, the people don't want war, but after all, it is the leaders of the country who determine the policy, and it is always a simple matter to drag the people along. Whether it is a democracy, or a fascist dictatorship, or a parliament, or a communist dictatorship. And the interviewer said, but in a democracy, the people have some say in the matter through their elected representatives. And Goring said, oh, that's all well and good, but voice or no voice, the people can always be brought to the bidding of the leaders. That is easy. All you have to do is tell them they are being attacked and denounce the pacifists for lack of patriotism and exposing the country to danger. It works the same way in any country. It reminds us, this interview excerpt reminds us that if you make people sufficiently afraid of others who are out to get them, you can bring out their worst. You can get them to just follow orders while committing atrocities. And that can happen here in this country today. It does happen here in this country today. <clears throat> One of my clergy colleagues, Erin Kolbeikstad, explains it this way. One of the most pernicious and destructive forms of idolatry in the U.S. today is what has become known as Christian nationalism. Because it takes a particular ideology and a particular approach to scripture and insists that anyone who doesn't hold to it, anyone who dares to criticize it, isn't a real American, isn't a real Christian isn't in line with God's intention for this country. <clears throat> and Aaron points out that this attitude ignores the fact that many of the earliest founding fathers were deists, and that there were already Jews and a wide variety of Christians in this country when it was founded. Christian nationalism also displays arrogance and hubris in ignoring the many modes of Christianity practiced around the globe today. The U.S. does not, no matter who tries to tell you this, the U.S. does not have most favored nation with God, status with God. Americans are not more valuable to God. We are not more beloved of God. We are children of God among all the children of God in the world. Now we can be patriotic without being nationalistic. We can have gratitude for our many freedoms, which include, by the way, the freedom to criticize and to disagree. What separates patriotism from nationalism is the recognition that our ultimate allegiance transcends our nation, our tribe, and our culture. Our highest allegiance. People of Jesus, our highest allegiance is not to flag and country, not to any particular human leader, but to the one embodied in the love of Jesus Christ, which allows us to understand how we're connected to each other here and all around the world, to all the other children of God, all beloved of God. God calls us through Christ to something larger than nationalism, larger than allegiance to any human ideology, something greater than the tribal instincts 
that lead us to sort people into good and bad, worthy and unworthy. Someone has noted that 365 times, once for every day of the year, the Bible tells us, fear not or do not be afraid. Here's the gospel text that's in your bulletin, a reminder, again, <clears throat> from, from Luke chapter 12. And this will be familiar too, to many of you. Consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not clothed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, you of little faith? And do not keep striving for what you are to eat and what you are to drink, and do not keep worrying. For it is the nations of the world, the worldly nations, that strive after all these things, and your Father knows that you need them. Instead, strive for the kingdom, his kingdom, and these things will be given to you as well. Do not be afraid, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Gabriel Marcel, a Christian existentialist said, in order to hope, in order to hope, one must know what it means to fear, to doubt, to despair. True Christian hope is born in the pits where there's, when there's nowhere else to look but up. Christian hope is born when we no longer look for human solutions to bring us a future. Christian hope is born when we're worn out with looking for yet another way to save ourselves. This is our call to discipleship in the face of violence and oppression born out of fear, to trust in God's safety, to trust in God's security in the face of the world's false promises about safety and security, to love radically the other, the different, the very ones the world urges us to judge or to exclude or to fear. To love as radically as God has loved us, sending Jesus to us while we were sinners, calling us and loving us even now while we are sinners. Scripture promises us, and isn't that Isaiah text? God, Scripture promises us that what we see in the world today is not all that there will ever be. However else you want to think about it, you can put it this simply. God wins. In the end, God wins. God's justice and goodness will prevail. The former things that cause us fear now have caused us fear will be swept away in God's coming kingdom. So sisters and brothers, children of God, whose promises are you going to believe? Where will you place your trust? These are life and death questions for our souls and for the world. So be of good courage. Do not be afraid. Scripture tells us a lot of times, do not be afraid. God loves you. Trust in that. Trust in that. Let it be so. Amen. Please stand as you are able for our responsive a call and response. What good is it if we say we love all people but give special treatment to a few? 
God calls us to love others as deeply as we love ourselves, with no strings attached. What good is it if we say we want God to show mercy towards us, but are quick to judge others? God calls us to forgive our sisters and brothers, to let mercy triumph over judgment. What good is it if we say we trust God in every moment, but live guided by our fears? We will speak and act as those who trust God to come and live in our fearful hearts. Our responsive hymn is number 191, God is our refuge mm -hmm. and our strength. Gracious God, we are grateful for this beautiful, crisp fall weather you're giving us. We're grateful for the beauty of the changing trees and the way everything looks so bright around us when the sun is shining. We're grateful for the many gifts that you shower on us, some of which we notice and some sort of go by because we take them for granted. Today, we especially give thanks to you for the connections that we have with people around the world, connections we build with churches in other countries and other cultures, reminding us that we are all your children and that we are all connected. We are grateful for the opportunities to celebrate joyful events like weddings and new babies that we have the opportunity to get together with family and old friends. And gracious God, we pray for those who are not well, who are suffering in mind, body, or spirit, who are anxious about their medical conditions, those who know their medical conditions and are anxious, for families who are worried, for families who have been bereaved, for those who have are grieving not just the death of others, but other kinds of losses that we experience in life. God, we are so ready to bring our prayers to you. And we say that we trust you, but sometimes we 
We don't necessarily seem to be so trusting. And yet, our trust is shown by the fact that week after week, we bring you these prayers. We bring you these prayers. We, we pray to you now these words of the poet. Thank you for all we forget, our gifts, not rights. Forgive us for all the grievances we remember too well. Save us from the self-pity, the self-seeking, the fat-heartedness which is true poverty. Guide us if we're willing and drive us if we're not into the hard ways of sacrifice which are just and loving. Make us wide-eyed for beauty and for our neighbor's need and goodness, wide-willed for peacemaking and for the confronting power with the call to compassion, wide-hearted for love and for the unloved, who are the hardest to touch and need it the most. Dull the envy in us which criticizes and complains life into a thousand ugly bits. Keep us honest and tender enough to heal, tough enough to be healed of our hypocrisies. Match our appetite for privilege with the stomach for commitment. Teach us the great cost of paying attention, that naked to the dazzle of your back as you pass, we may know we are always on holy ground. Breathe into us the restlessness and courage to make something new, something saving, and something true, that we may understand what it truly is to rejoice. Gracious God, we bring to you all of the prayers that we say here. We bring to you all of the prayers that remain in our hearts unspoken, and all of the prayers that lie so deep in us, we don't know that they're there, but you do. And so even those we bring to you. And all of our prayers we bring to you in the mighty and gracious and loving name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who taught his disciples to pray together, saying, Our Father, We are given many kinds of gifts. We all have gifts that we can offer to God. We all have things that we can do to help contribute to the kingdom. And at this time, we recognize that by presenting to God a portion of the material gifts that we've been given.
please join me in the unison prayer of dedication. O oh God, God, we commit, commit to you these, these and, and all our gifts in the service of acting as co-workers with you and one another, another, so that peace and justice may flow like a mighty stream and cover your world with your love. Amen. Please remain standing for our sending hymn number 345, Dear Lord and Father of Men. Thank you. 